exceptional speaker who was formerly a software engineer at both IBM as well as Lucent uh, Technologies. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, gosh. I remember Lucent before he turned to OSF. <laughs> well, you guys can swap back that out. Um, please welcome the field CTO of Vault TV, Ryan Bell. My name is Ryan. I, uh, I, I, I tested the first time. I'm not going to introduce this formally as a software developer. I, I think of myself very much as a software developer. I am the CTO of Volt. I started working at Volt about five and a half years ago when we started formalizing the commercial project out of the H Store Research Paper. Um, we finished trivia as so Vertica, which was a column store. It was, it was founded out of a paper called C Store, C for column. And uh, Volt TV is a row store, and so it's kind of a joke to have a horizontal store. So Store. Uh, this is the first time I've given this talk. I usually, the talks I give, I usually give them four or five times, and so most people who see them have seen a simple practice version, so you guys are hopefully willing guinea pigs. Um, uh, and so I, I want to talk a little bit, a little bit about some of the trends I see, and I want to put that in this context about why I think what we're building at Gold is really interesting. We're going to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to go into a little bit about what Gold is, and then um, I've written large portions of Bold, I've talked to a ton of our customers, all of them, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions people have. I can take you on the, the conversation to more technical space, to more of a, a thought-provoking kind of what is best space, whatever we want. So I'm happy to take questions and kind of direct that. I was thinking to myself, um, like what really is best in life? I've been working with a, working with a life coach lately, and she asked me this question, and I immediately told her the Conan answer. She wasn't so thrilled with lamentation. She's like, I don't think so, Ryan. That's not it at all. Uh, so I stopped and I thought for a while, well, what is really best in life for me? Is it making really fast databases? I mean, we think Bolt, Bolt does a million transactions a second in a commodity cluster. Really, really fast database. This is my dog, Banjo. I do really love Banjo. Uh, thank you. And, uh, she's she's good at on this for sure. And she loves playing fetch. So maybe what's best in life is fast databases and a tennis ball. I don't know. I needed a more technical answer than that. So what I really enjoy doing, the reason I started working at Bull, the reason I show up every day, the reason I uh, come down to New York and know the Red Sox are playing World Series game number two miles from my house. Good, you know. good. <laughs> I'm a Mets fan. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, that seems worse, I'm afraid. But. <laughs> so what I really like to do is I really like to make products. And uh, as introduced, I worked at, I worked at Lucid, actually I worked for uh, Cascade and Ascend, which were eventually acquired by Lucid and made telecommunications here. Um, if you've ever sent data across AT's data network and it arrived, that long tough software I wrote didn't arrive. It's a dollars responsibility. Uh, I worked also at Data Power, which was uh, an XML processing middleware company that IBM bought, and uh, we wrote web services security software. So if you do Bank of America ATM transactions, at least up to three years ago, I don't know recently what they're doing, you actually touch software I wrote. And that's really interesting, we're making, making tools that affect the world. I think that that's actually something that I, that I think is what I really enjoy really doing. I kind of like making uh, um, the tools that fit together into a certain point in time, into a certain ecosystem of other emerging technologies that change the world somehow, right? make the world a little bit better. And that's going to sound really egotistical. The reason I like doing that, uh, kind of under the covers, is because I, I actually prefer to do it privately. I'm not really a consumer and kind of iPhone kind of guy. So what does it? What do you think about data management? Like what's, what's the history? Right? What's it leading up to? And in the context of, of liking to make products that sort of hit the intersection of emerging technologies, what's the big picture space around data management? Well, in the 1970s and 1980s, databases were largely used for really boring tasks. This is really boring today, right? Basic inventory control, agent typing away at a green screen, hoping to some life for you, right? was all, all really pretty simple by today's standards. And over the last 10 to 15 years, right, we built the internet collectively as technologists. And what did we use it for? We basically used it to catalog all of the world's information. Right? All of the world's people are cataloged in Facebook, all of its books in Amazon, all of the web content in Google. These are just review sites, right? All these spaces have just basically gone around and asked people to catalog all the locations find your house from space on a map, 
it's really amazing how much data has been cataloged. The data management problems that were a challenge over the last 15 plus years have been challenges of capacity, cataloging, retrieval, availability, geographical replication. These have been the trends of data management leading up to, I think, a current point in time. But there's a new trend, there's an intersection now. An intersection between having cataloged all of this information and all of the mobile devices that we carry with us. All of the cheap computing that we can embed into the internet of everything, as Cisco calls it, right? Your car knows where you are if you have one star. If you're walking through the mall, your phone uh, joins an access point. I know where the sensor is, and I know where your phone is, because I know your MAC address, I know who you are. Now you walk into a Starbucks store. Soon when you walk into a Starbucks store in Canada, your phone will, will join an access point there, and Volt software will be able to create a personalized experience as part of a staff of infrastructure, as a staff of technology. They'll be able to connect your loyalty program to your mobile wallet, to your point of presence. Right? All of this information isn't necessarily about cataloging the world. That's kind of what led up to this. All of this information is about what's going to happen in the next moment. Delivering information to you just as you need it, based on who you are, what you've done, what you've been looking at, and what your location is. We see this now in ads that are becoming, or applications that are becoming really popular, like Google Now, right? Google Now is exactly this application, right? It's combining your point of presence information with your phone, with the record of your habits, along with all of the catalog information about what's around you, what's in your vicinity, to tell you the traffic, what restaurant you might want to eat at, what time you should leave to go home, what your next meeting is. It's about delivering information to you in the moment that you need it. This is a really different data management problem from the problem of cataloging all of the information. This is a problem, and I'm pointing this term today as far as I know, the just-in-time internet problem. Right? This is a problem, it's not about volume of information and batch processing and machine learning against that as much as it's a problem about immediate ingestion, about an analytic at the point of ingestion, making a decision based on the data available, and then producing a response to a user in real time. Now there's an example of this that I'm sure almost all technologists in the room are familiar with, and that's ad survey. But ad survey is from the place in the trail here, and uh, I don't know, I don't know why it's ad survey. I wish there was a better, a better example than just ad survey, because ad survey has been boring and no one likes to think about it. But, when you serve ads, right, we all know that they're customized. We've all had the experience of going to a website, looking at something, about buying something, and then for three days later, being flagged by that advertisement, right? Like, BMW really wants me to buy that new motorcycle, right? They keep showing me that ad over and over and over again everywhere I go, right? They're associating that ad to my caps with what I'm doing presently. How do they know to show me that advertisement? Well, there are large ad networks that broker the spots available to display ads on web pages. And all of that brokering is done largely in real time. You go to a web page, it says, I know who your demographic information is, I know who you are based upon cookies or information it's been able to set based upon uh, browser IDs and other identifiers. They can look up a block of information. It turns out that the, that database of information for US consumers is roughly seven to nine terabytes in size. It's not that much data, honestly and they know where you've been recently. They can collect over 30 different metrics from a website, where your mouse has hovered, where you were previously, if you've clicked on this advertisement in the past or the near future, where you came from, who your site referrer was, right? All of these different pieces of information can be brought together in real time, and they can be run through an algorithm to composite an ad for you. Not for your neighbor, not for anyone, just for you. They can match your gender, it can match your race, it can match the weather outside, right? If it's a rainy day, maybe they want to show you and have rain in the background. All of the interactions with these ads are measured also in real time by correlating data from content delivery networks where you've clicked and had data delivered to you, to the information that was preserved by the browser and sent back as part of serving that ad, right? And then complex measurements are run over to understand which ads are most effective at lead generation and at click conversion, right? And they're tuned in real time to provide better and better results. This is just one example of a just-in-time problem. It's not a problem of volume or cataloging information, 
It's a problem of taking inputs in the real moment and combining them together to make an interesting experience. I like to think of these, these things as, as moments of interaction, right? When you have an interaction, we want it to be customized to our experience. We don't want it to be generic. We expect that people, uh, we basically expect the internet more and more to know who we are and what we want to limit that content to us, right? And that's a problem about, about real-time processing. I think that the really interesting trend in data management is going to be the intersection of the fact that we've cataloged all of this information with the fact that we now have the devices to identify who and where we are in real time. And the intersection of those two trends, I think, is a powerful moment of disruption. And it's, it's really fascinating from a market position. We know the companies that were successful in cataloging all of the world's data, right? They're worth billions of dollars, their stocks are not trading, there's thousands of dollars a share in the case of Google. And we know all of the country, companies that know our location. There are phone providers, are, in some cases there are electrical grid providers, there are the people that um, sell us the infrastructure that surrounds us. And I think that there's a really interesting opportunity to combine our infrastructure right, with these databases, with our cheap computing infrastructure, to produce new experiences. That's what I think is going to happen. That's my, uh, that's my early 2015 prediction, I guess. Uh, this isn't novel on my part. A lot of big companies think this is going to happen as well. Some of them advertise about it publicly. Every time you see an IBM, let's build a smarter planet advertisement, I rejoice a little bit because it's a bold DP advertisement in disguise. Right? It's talking about smart infrastructure, smart responses, real-time efficiency. Again, it's the same concept. If you haven't seen it, and I, I've never seen it on TV, but Cisco has an Internet of Everything advertisement site. And they ask you the question, what if the next big thing isn't one thing, but lots of little things? It's the connection of things. The ability for these things to communicate with one another. Right? Again, that's a real-time problem about interactions. Now, a lot of the examples I gave were very consumer-oriented. Consumer They're easy to understand. It's easy to understand the experience of walking into a Starbucks, having a phone in your pocket. There are many cases where the same pattern of data management applies not just in the consumer space, but across a number of different verticals. There's a large virtualization effort happening in the telecommunication industry now, largely outside of the United States and kind of second tier markets where they're really mobile first markets. They never build out large copper line phone networks. They're very mobile centric. They're, um, the cost per subscriber has to be tightly controlled because of the economies in those markets. And that leads to virtualization, a combination of elasticity, because people travel with their phones, congregate, and need to be able to, to scale and plan for scale differently from a copper line network, in combination with cost control, and in combination with uh, just the infrastructure available. All of these things lead to virtualization. Uh, and so uh, here's an interesting example. The Verizon network, guess how much data the Verizon network generates in real time about its subscriber's location and presence point of presence? in the United States. Any guesses? How many terabytes a day? 38 gigabytes a second. Mm -hmm. so, a second. So a day? I, there's a lot of seconds in a day, terabytes and petabytes Maybe very quickly. Like, yeah. this, <laughs> but think about it. Like, can you picture a database that can process 38 gigabytes of input per second? I can. I can. We made one, but it's uh, almost uh, uh, very, very close to it. Certainly, you could scale that across geographies. And, and so you could have all of this valuable location information that ties you to your subscriber, that ties you to your network, that associates you to who you are, to the corporate information gathered, and do something interesting with it. Um, smart grids. Smart grids are emerging. Siemens has sold over six different smart grid projects in the last half year. Right. Um, the UK recently closed a bid uh, that will have 53 million smart meters generating 5 million inputs I've forgotten the even time, per, per day, I believe, per hour. It's on the next slide. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and they, uh, anyway, so they'll do this, they'll do smart metering for water, right? They'll tell you where water is. Imagine that you're AT&T and you're building a cell network. The power provider that provides power to that network, the power intensity activity right, broadcasting the cell phone signal, they, um, the power provider actually buys power in real time. Right? It's a real time market, they're bidding for that. 
they would like to reduce the granularity at which they can offer that power and pricing to their major customers, right? Like AT&T. That's a real-time problem, right? That's a real-time bidding problem, a lot like the real-time advertising bidding problem, right? More and more markets are basically eliminating inefficiencies by doing real-time pricing. We've been familiar with the liquidity markets, right? Especially here in New York. Um, and, and the same thing is going to happen in other industries. Uh, electricity, namely among them. All of these different verticals are places where there are people using VoltDB to manage real-time interactions and make real-time decisions. These are all, these are all, all of these verticals are what I think are evidence of some of the trends that I'm talking about. That's kind of the end of chapter one. There are only, there's only a few more chapters. So, what are some of the trends? Let's start thinking a little bit about some of the technology that you would have to assemble in order to process data feeds on the scale of gigabytes per second, right? Millions and millions of events per second, making intelligent decisions against each of them, against stateful data with a relatively complex set of transactional business rules, right? What kind of technology would you need to build to accomplish that task? Well, one thing that I think uh, was maybe, ch it, was, it was challenged when we first started both well, five or six years ago, but is never challenged now, is that OLTP problems fit in memory. So first of all, all of these interaction problems, I'm just going to refer to that as modern online transaction processing. And we can discuss why, but I'm just going to use that term here. And all they fit in memory. They're basically not holding this huge volume of data. Instead, they're holding a moving window, they're holding the tip of it, or some summary of it. Right? They're making real-time decisions against it, and then they're passing all of these records downstream for long-term storage. Fundamentally, if you want to make decisions on an event-wise basis, you need to be using a row-oriented transactional technology. You're doing a lookup. Here's a person. Here's the place they were previously. Take these two rows of information, combine them with some logic, make a decision, issue a response. That's an OLTP problem. right? It's not an OLAP problem. An OLAP problem is I have uh, all of, I have six years of, of history of every remote control click that happened on a Comcast network. Let me run an, 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 an analysis against all of that data to try to produce some trending so that I understand which shows perform best back to back. Right? Long scans of long columns of information, of petabytes of data. That's an oh, lap problem, right? Making a real-time decision against an incoming event based upon just one or two other facts, that's a transactional problem. It's not an analytics problem. The transactional data sets that, need, that you need to perform these properties, they fit in memory. And more importantly, they're growing, the size of this data set grows more slowly than the trend of DRAM density and price improving right, in terms of how much of it you can shove in a box. It's not unusual these days. Uh, if you're familiar with SAP Canada, they'll tell you to go buy a box and put a terabyte of RAM in it, right, one box. There are a number of VoltDB customers that run with a quarter terabyte of memory in a single box, right? And they cluster these together to build multi-terabyte in-memory databases, right? So memory is becoming cheap to the point that I think as, as consumers, we don't really understand how much of it you can put into a box in an affordable way. Secondly, there's technology coming to market from a number of different vendors, including Toshiba, Intel, Hitachi, that is going to combine sort of the non volatile NAND SSD style flash with some of this uh, kind of an order of magnitude less speed than DRAM. You're going to start to see tiered memory storage architectures. In the same way that today we had perhaps disk tiered to tape and then flash tiered to disk, you're going to see DRAM tiered to very flash persistent flash. And that's interesting for a number of reasons. One is that persistent flash is cool, right? It's not, it doesn't need a constant electrical refresh like DRAM, and that means that it runs at a cooler temperature, you can shove a lot of it in a box at once, it can be very dense. You'll be able to have multiple terabytes of this stuff in memory. Some of this, some of these things are coming to market already, right? Um, EMC, for example, sells PCI Express NAND flash, basically an SSD on a PCI Express card. You get really fast access to it, right? Faster than your SSD you're going over the North Bridge, right? And again, multiple terabytes of fast, of fast memory. And so all of these trends, to me, mean that memory is going to become more pervasive in transactional computing, not less. And the technologies that succeed here will be in memory based. Secondly, if you want to scale a really high volume, high throughput transactional problem, then you need to be able to scale concurrency to data, right? You have to have a lot of things being able to access data concurrently. 
If you're, thinking, if you're familiar with Oracle RAP or other similar systems, they do this essentially by using really expensive share storage, right? Fiber channel attached storage, lots of independent compute nodes, but fundamentally one share storage pool. That's really expensive. It's highly contentious in terms of data access, and it's not in any way cloud friendly, right? Cloud, cloud providers have embraced SSD, but they won't really sell you uh, the kind of storage that Oracle RAP would require. And so virtualization is another driver it works well with memory, right? Commodity memory servers sharded in a cloud. So I, that's, certainly, that's certainly one trend. The other trend is that we scale out now, right? We scale our services across commodity uh, resources, right? We don't build big scale up servers. This is just essentially the cloud story. I don't, I don't think it really needs a lot of uh, evidence for validation. I think it's just something that we assume is going to stay that way. So the technology, kind of the the basic resource that you have at your disposal to solve this problem is a combination of memory and horizontal scaling. What are some of the problems that you have to be able to solve? And uh, if, uh, so let, me take, let me take kind of a temperature check of the audience. Is this like, should we go higher, lower? Is this, is this an interesting topic for people? Okay, so I always want to, want to be sure. So what are the problems you have to solve? Across all of those verticals, across all of those different um, ingestion patterns, we see among our customers a few common patterns. I like to speak about patterns as a developer. I like patterns. If someone tells me, go implement that, and I can name it as a pattern, oh, well, that's a three-tiered architecture. Or, oh, that's you know even a design pattern. Right? It's a nice way to solve problems. So we look for patterns among what our customers do with our database. And we try to explain those to other people so that they can better understand the problem in front of them. One of the first patterns, stream speed ingestion. You have to be able to process this data event-wise, not batch-wise. So you see a common anti-pattern here. People want to be able to absorb a lot of data and record it, but they haven't had a chance on a per-event basis to clean it up, check its veracity, make correlations in real time, dedupe it, identify which partners aren't providing data within a quality of service guarantee. So they have to go back and do all of that historically. So they write a bunch of data to their OLAP system or a bunch of data to HDFS, then they write a bunch of data scrubbers that go and pull the data out of HDFS, clean it all up, and write it back into HDFS, right? All of that work is lost opportunity. You can do that in real time. You can make real time reactions. You can do real time quality of service routing, for example, against the voice over IP network by looking at the duration gaps of uh, call detail records. You can do real time uh, QoS and operational enforcement and alarming if you have a data feed that isn't performing appropriately. Perhaps you stop receiving data from one geography. You want to know that immediately, not 20 minutes later once your scrubber process has determined that that's the case where it might not even be true anymore, right? So stream speed adjusts the ability to work on an event-wise basis and make event-wise decisions. Uh, export to all that. All of these problems are generating vast amounts of information. And the work that you want to do against that information falls relatively plainly into two different camps, at least. Sometimes there are three and four other tasks, but there's always at least two. One is the ability to process it in real time, right, kind of these patterns. The second is the ability to archive it. Even when people don't know what they're going to do with their data in real time, they still archive it. They're afraid to throw it away, and disks are so cheap that they'll just store it. Right? That's why HDFS is, in one reason, so popular. We talk to data providers say, I have petabytes of data. I don't really know what to do with it, but I have an idea of something that I can do in real time. I can just look at it in real time. I'd like to make this one decision. Right? Can I start doing that? Right? So first they handled the problem of collecting all of this data. Now they want to start being able to operate it against it in real time. And once they operate it against it in real time, they want to be able to correlate events. For example, the, the personal malicious stock exchange. They, they have two different streams of data that are emerging from all completed trades. And these two pieces, these two streams need to be checked against each other, right? If, if, some, if some trade comes through and appears in one stream but not the other, then it needs to be manually justified at the end of the day, right? They need to flag that. They would like to do that in real time so that they can detect, again, quality problems or downstream errors that are leading to some long series of corrections. And that's a real-time real problem, right? They, they use full TV. For that. So you need to be able to capture this data, you need to be able to feed it to all app store in some efficient way. Real-time aggregation and summary, you want to be able to have a picture of the tip of your stream. Uh, an example of this is uh, an ISP that does distributed now with service attack detection. So they take lots of data from all of their endpoints in real time, they keep about 15 minutes of it in memory, they run common aggregations against that to look for 
uh, remote IP addresses that are causing distributed disruption across their services, right? And they shut it off in real time. Or uh, a voice over IP network that's reselling uh, basically VoIP, they will look at call detail records. They look for records that are really close together, right? Someone uh, picked up a phone, dialed a number, had a crappy connection, hung up immediately and called back. Tiny short duration phone call. Those really short duration phone calls are a great heuristic for a bad quality network, right? That quality varies during the course of the day in real time. They see that trend in real time, they route the next customer away from that network right, and until that trend dissipates, right? A real time decision based upon the ability to aggregate sort of the average length of phone call, right? So an aggregation problem. Um, and if a lot of people have, have problems that are very write intensive, but are also very, they think of them like caches, right? But it's a really write intensive cache. This is a, kind of a, it's actually kind of a hard problem to describe, and I don't have a name for this pattern yet, but one, one way that you can see evidence of this is if you use Memcached a lot, and you go to Memcached D forums, and one of the more common questions is how do I make my cache kind of consistent across all my devices, right? Memcached is like, well, we don't do that, that's how we scale. Right, well, people have that problem. They want to have sort of a consistent, right, intensive cache. And an in-memory high-throughput database replaces that caching requirement, right, because it essentially can work as a consistent store of that information. So this slide, um, this slide's a little bit marketing-y. I don't know if I, I completely buy in, but I kind of put this slide up as a challenge because I think it's, uh, it, it, I hope it provokes some thoughts and some conversations. So the things I've described, are they kind of what we think of as classic NoSQL problems? Right? I've talked a lot about event-wise processing, so does that mean that it's a, a set problem, a continuous event processing problem? Or is it really just really fast OLTP? Right? So obviously I'm a vendor that makes a really fast OLTP database, and I'm going to tell you that it's a fast OLTP problem. Right? So but why, why is that? Well, NoSQL systems were, were basically built to scale rights and then to scale the volume of data and to allow you to do pretty uh, inexpensive retrieval of that data, right? That's kind of the core pattern. And then they vary in terms of their availability strategy, the document atomicity strategy, and their exact street state schema strategy, right? Whether they're document oriented or column family oriented. But essentially, they were written to scale rights and they gave up the ability to do complex transactions against data in order to accomplish that. Right. Well, in VoltDB's case, we gave up the ability to store a vast amount of information. Everything we store is in memory, right? But we maintain the capability of, of managing complex transactions against that really hot, highly mutating state. Um, CEP systems are fundamentally not that stable, right? The biggest problem with trying to use a CEP system is that you can't go and store two terabytes of data. Right? They're great at scaling a large number of continuous calculations against an event stream, but they're bad for storing a big chunk of information that you want to be able to transact against, to look up against, or do arbitrary you know, BI dashboarding, slicing, and dicing kinds of various things. CEP is continuous event processing or stream processing, like stream based CEP system. Um, they're not super, they, they never became very popular, but they're uh, well understood in kind of they have become um, top of the common data management tactics because they were sufficiently safe for the good part. Um, so basically, the, the takeaway from, from, from this slide here is that I think that there is a new problem. And it's a problem that's the, the combination of all of you know, the first part of this talk, right? All of the data we've collected in catalog combined with all of the information about our location and who we are and the desire to make smart decisions in real time. That's a new data management problem. It doesn't fit cleanly into any of the categories that we understand well as a broad community of practice, right? Not a warehousing problem. It doesn't fit into a single Oracle server. It certainly doesn't fit in a single MySQL server. It's not the kind of problem that we built super high availability, availability you know, SQL stores to solve, right? It's a unique problem. It's a role-oriented problem. It's a highly transactional problem. I think it's where OOTP is going to in the future. So here's kind of another way of looking at the data management universe. Um, data has value based upon its age. It has, it has value in isolation when it's really new. Right? If something happens right now, that event is probably an interesting input to a decision, either a decision of personalization, an alarming, my transformer or this electric pole is about to catch on fire, do something about that. Right? 
those pieces of information are valuable in isolation. Once theta ages, it really becomes more interesting in aggregate, right? It becomes interesting when I can kind of walk an algorithm over all of the clip data from Comcast set-top boxes and think about what does it mean over six years. Any individual clip is of relatively low importance, but the aggregate of all of those clicks combined is of great interest, right, to data scientists. And so here on the left, you have data that's new, right? And the activity that creates value against that new is largely transactional and interactive. The, on the, your right, my left and right capability is minimal. I'll turn around and get that right. Yeah. On, on my right, right, is data that's analyzed in aggregate. On the right, we have lots of data warehousing techniques that we're familiar with. And we have Hadoop and HTFS, which are kind of commoditizing the storage of unstructured data. And the left, this is a really high value area that we haven't really built tools for. And I think that we haven't built those tools because the trend of wanting those tools is just now emerging. It's the combination of this catalog of information, it's the internet, with cheap computing that comes with us everywhere we go. Right? As the combination that allows a real-time interaction and a real-time personalization. In the middle, uh, we have what we kind of call uh, it's like the base case problem, right? Slow or simple problems where there are traditional relational database managers that do a perfectly fine job, right? So all of the typical business applications that are built on top of Oracle, I'm not suggesting that they're going to be disrupted or replaced by this new OTP market. What I'm suggesting is that in the same way that we designed and built tools to solve uh, the collection of large amounts of data, you're going to see the market begin to adopt tools that let you make real-time decisions against data as it arrives. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what VoltDB is, and kind of walk into a little bit of the technology of it. Um, happy to answer any questions. This part of the conversation is usually much better if it's interactive, because there's some a, lot of, there's a little bit of jargon, and I just want to be sure that, that it's clear. Um, so VoltDB, it combines three fundamental things. It takes all of the transactional learning from, uh, from Dr. Stonebreaker's 1,000 years of database history. I don't, I don't believe I've ever met Mike, by the way, so I'm curious. All right, so if you, if, if you met Mike, he's about like this tall and, and um, not particularly young and has a lot of personality. And he loves transactional relational database management systems. So uh, he certainly believes that asset is important, uh, that transactions are important, that relational models have value over navigation-oriented models uh, that you saw historically in Codicil, and he sees similarity to in some NoSQL stores. Uh, so SQL DDL, declarative language to query from all important, right? VoltDB has kept all of those good things. VoltDB is designed from the beginning to scale on commodity hardware. If you look at how legacy databases were designed, they were designed for computing resources that were fundamentally scarce. In the 1980s, a computer had little memory, wasn't attached to a high-speed network, had tiny, very, very slow disks, right? Each of us has a phone in our pocket that dwarfs the computing power of even what was available to us on a desktop 15 years ago, right? And databases design, however, never really adapted to that change in technology. Modern CPUs are superfluous. We have more cores and we know what to do with in some circumstances. So how do we manage concurrency to data? Well, it's very different. If you have one core that's very slow, attached to a very slow disk resource, you're going you're to manage data concurrency very differently than if you have 50 cores, all of which are very high speed and have access to high speed memory resources, right? Those two fundamental physical architectures are going to demand a change to your software architecture. VoltDB has responded to that and it's designed a system uh, for really modern computing resources. And as a result, you put these two things together with some other um, decisions that were made in the architecture, you end up with a transactional database that scales uh, in a cloud-friendly way that has extremely differentiated performance. I was going to say, um, you know, this is kind of antique notion uh, that you used to want to separate your online transaction processing from your BI stack, essentially for performance reasons, right? You want to do e-commerce or something. Then this this seems to kind of turn that upside down. So it looks like your if your relational model is still in the OLTP, let's call it data layer. Um, then that's coexisting side by side with this high speed streaming and event processing? I think what will happen um, 
is a little bit of that, but I think more of what will happen is that people will build applications to deal with high-speed transactions, and they're not going to go and change a lot of their traditional business applications as deeply. Um, SAP, right, Canada is basically a play to build accelerators for some of those applications based around a combination of this technology and the real lab technology, and so they're trying that. Um, I think that the technology that's being built here is largely going to be a disruptive technology that creates new applications, right, or that responds to the desire to create new applications, more so than a wholesale replacement of what we're familiar with as our typical business databases. There are some exceptions. So, um, for example, uh, one of the VoltaB use cases is resource tracking. Uh, and this is, you might consider this traditionally to be a relatively typical problem, right? Where, where are my devices? Where are they located? What's an inventory? Except in this case, the resources being tracked are underground in the world's largest platinum mines. They have tens of thousands of people and pieces of equipment up to a mile deep or something absurd. Right? I'm not a geologist, but the numbers are mind boggling. And this mine, across many tiers, many levels, right? And they have put sensors on all of these equipments to be able to manage um, maintenance schedules and emissions and gases. At the same time, they've put sensors on all of their employees, which are currently striking in a fashion, but it's, it's unfortunate. But um, in order to monitor safety, right, is this employee deprived of oxygen or being, or being exposed to, a, to a, a toxin of some kind underground? And at the same time, they've instrumented the location of all of their life-saving equipment underground so that there is an emergency in real time, in response to that emergency, they can know exactly where is everyone, where is the safety equipment. Or before that emergency happens, they can detect something bad is going to happen by seeing a sensor trend, right? So what is the data that this thing creates? Is it typically like what you might think of as, as resource tracking or an inventory problem? Not really. It's tens of thousands of sensors underground, each one creating a reading every 200 milliseconds, right? That's very different. Five times a second times a couple tens of thousand inputs, that's a lot of inputs. Now you're, you, need a, you need an application that can maintain a stateful record of all of these different things, look for dangerous trends against them, while simultaneously handling 50,000 events, 50,000 transactions per second. Right? So there's an example where it's hard to say, you know, okay, that's kind of a traditional idea of resource tracking, but it's at a very new scale that necessitates a different <coughs> Well, it's closer conceptually to process, real-time process monitoring, right? Or SCADA systems or something. Exactly, yeah. But what, so what differentiates it in a nutshell? Uh, in a nutshell, people are using uh, here a couple of different aspects. One, the ability to, to combine and, and record this data, transact against it, and then archive it, right? Um, and the ability to store like more of it in memory and to deploy it to cloud-based resources. These are the main things. Yes. Polytechnic was mostly Arabic and Indian Asian versus Stanford University, which is mostly English. These students, English American students, will you say that the hard application of mathematical theory would help in the real time, um, real time making decisions versus versus the the the, the, the soft side of semantics? Of, I mean, of yeah. So yeah. Um, certainly better math never hurts, right? I think, I think um, here's how I think about this. I think of my whole oh, one more thing. Uh, one of my professors, when I was with my second master's in cybersecurity in my Bali, he introduced me to the Secret Service cybersecurity, so the NSA is in Brooklyn. Good to know. <laughs> so, I, I, tend to, I, I have to think of, um, I, I like this metaphor. Some people just don't. Some people don't like this metaphor. Some people do, but I like to share it. I like to think of my online analytics processing store, my archive of all of my historic records. I like to think of that as my source of wisdom. Right? It represents all of my memories, everything I've witnessed and seen and collected. Right? It's kind of my wisdom as the source of my wisdom. And I like to think of my real-time online transaction transaction processing store as my source of action. Right? It's how I react in real time. How I make a decision. And these are really two different concepts, right? The collection of my memories versus my ability to act immediately, right? So we look at the patterns from our historical data and using you know, deep mathematical models, right, machine learning algorithms, uh, scientific correlation finding, clustering finding, all of these kind of uh, common statistical techniques, we draw from them uh, 
hypotheses about how we can have a better impact on our customers or safety or fraud or security. And then we implement those algorithms against something that can act in real time against the events that are coming into place, right? And so that's a little bit about how I think around the, the utility of where the math should sit versus where the decision should sit. And here's some performance numbers to kind of give a background of, of what I'm talking about when I'm saying really fast database. So uh, I don't know why I have negative 50,000 TPS on that axis, and that's PowerPoint being mean to me. But so this is a three node cluster that's been configured to be highly available. So all data in this cluster is replicated once you can tolerate the failure of any one of the three nodes. The only thing in any way exceptional about this is it happened to be networked with 10 gigabit Ethernet instead of gigabit Ethernet. Otherwise, it's just like commodity ISEP and white box servers. They're running a workload that varies from 10% read, 90% write, extremely write intensive workload, the blue line to 90% read, 10% write. So relatively cold data that's mutating less frequently. And on the bottom is the number of independent transactions that could be done. So this application is doing relatively simple transactions, kind of an intelligent upsert, so a check, look, and maybe, maybe uh, upsert. Not a ton of SQL involved, but still it's doing about 250,000 transactions a second with client round trip latencies of under five milliseconds, right? So this is kind of the scale of what we mean by this. This is one of three nodes, right? So this is under, $12,000, under $15,000 worth of hardware, right? Doing 250,000 transactions per second continuously. Um, we built clusters of 20 to 30 nodes capable of running up to 3 million transactions a second. We built a cluster in Amazon uh, that ran 877,000 transactions per second. A uh, community member built that to test an Erlang client he drove, that he wrote, sorry, for this an Erlang client. Uh, so we're talking about large computing capacity, right? That's and, and really fast, 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 fast database, right? Versus petabytes uh, yeah, of data, we're talking gazillions uh, of transactions, right? So VoltDB, every decision we make in VoltDB is really, in terms of development, is based on one of these concepts. Does it make the system uh, better at transactions? Does it make the system scale better? Does it improve the fault tolerance of the availability story? Um, does it make your data more durable? Does it help with this idea of connecting data to, to your OLAP system? Um, and some, some WAN replication stuff is probably a little too low level to talk about in this particular point of the conversation. So I want to walk through a little bit, and I'm not sure, I, I guess I've spoken for 40 minutes. I've been told that I have you guys for like six hours. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the technology behind Volt. Um, I'm going to walk through this at a high level. If anyone has detailed questions, please just find me afterwards, and I'd be more than happy to have a, a technical conversation around some of the design decisions in Volt. So first of all, Volt, like I said a few times, it runs on commodity hardware, it runs in a cluster. That means that it partitions data across a cluster, a lot like the NoSQL systems you may be familiar with. So if you're familiar with a, like a document store that does some kind of distributed hash table sort of organization of data, VoltDB works similarly, except instead of distributing documents across the cluster, we distribute rows from tables. All right, so in VoltDB, uh, you can have a table, you can identify one column or one attribute of that table as your partitioning attribute. That basically means that the value in that row, right, corresponding to that column, is going to be the key to the hash function that tells you where that row lives in the cluster. So we take a single server, we chop it into a bunch of partition containers, right? Roughly, um, if you have basically four-fifths to two-thirds of your cores in that box can get dedicated to partition containers one-to-one. -one, right? So if I've got eight cores, maybe I have six partition containers on a single server. Each partition container contains slices of the database, right? So a few rows from table one, a few rows from table two, a few rows from table three, right? The organization of which rows go to which container is determined by this partitioning algorithm that's run against the, against the specified partitioning column. That's a long way of saying the data is organized into shards. <laughs> so number two, clients connect to any node in the database and they start sending transactions to the system. The, the two biggest differences between VoltDB and an off-the-shelf kind of commodity uh, database is one, VoltDB is the partition for scale, which I don't think is controversial, and two, uh, VoltDB gets rid of client-side commit control. Right, so in a database that you might be familiar with, you can say from the client, begin transaction, do some SQL, do some SQL, do some SQL, a lot of round trips back and forth to the database, and then commit. 
If anyone's tried to make a database application scale, you'll know that that causes a lot of internal lock and latch retention, right, on the database itself. You've got all these clients concurrently holding long-lived transactional contacts in the database. VoltDB doesn't do that. VoltDB, the unit of a transaction, is a single stored procedure call. Okay, so you can call a Java stored procedure. That stored procedure can combine a pretty arbitrary number of SQL statements with Java for business logic. And uh, and that is the transaction, right? So the, the side effects of that procedure commit or they roll back. But there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the procedure and the transaction. Uh, you don't have to write Java by any means to use VoltDB. You can declare um, SQL only procedures directly into a DDL file. You can write Groovy plus SQL statements into a DDL file if you're a Groovy fan. And we do ad hoc basically auto commit on a per statement basis so that you can just sit from a console and Type SQL and do that you know, basically out of the thing. Um, so, uh, so why why have we made these decisions? So three fundamental decisions: horizontal scaling, it's in memory, and there's no client side commit control. Um, so the in memory and the client side commit control decisions they go together. You know, having one and not the other isn't so interesting, but having them both together is really powerful. If you have both of these things together, it means that the transaction never blocks on a resource. It never needs to block on a disk read because all of the data is available in memory. It never has to block up the network, right? Because it has the entire transaction work to do once it begins. So it doesn't need to hold a lot of data for a long time, waiting for a network trip for the client to decide what to do. This means that in full, once a transaction begins, it can run to completion without ever waiting for another resource, right? has all the resources it needs, right, when it begins to run. It has access to the data it requires. It has all of the SQL and all of the logic that can run. It doesn't need to wait on a buffer cache. It doesn't need to wait on disk. It doesn't need to wait on a client to tell it whether to commit or roll back. This is a fundamental uh, combination of, of design points that allows the system to do something really unique. It can run its transactions serially back to back instead of allowing a lot of concurrent access to a piece of data, it can put the transactions serially and then just run them first in, first out. Right? So VoltDB, in a way, is essentially a big uh, kind of NPP FIFO processor. Right? So we've divided our server into a set of partitions. Each partition has a FIFO queue in front of it. Every partition has a, a single uh, writer thread in it that has exclusive write access to the data of that partition. It's just pulling transaction requests off of that queue, running them to completion. On a modern computer, this is much, much faster than trying to manage concurrency control to data. It eliminates memory coherency control. It eliminates locking and latching, right? It eliminates uh, the ability to do any kind of concurrency management against data. All of these things thrash memory. They thrash memory caches, and they thrash memory coherence protocols on a modern computer. Can work and be much, much faster working in this serial operation. So you're saying there's never a concurrent transaction under VoltDB? In VoltDB, the level of concurrency is the number of independent partitions you have. They're all running transactions independently. So they're concurrent parallel ones. Yeah, it was more parallel than concurrent. Right? And, and, and the, so but the, remember, the throughput of it, that seems unintuitive to people. Like, well, wait a minute, how can that possibly be fast? It's fast because the transactions that you're doing tend to be very small, right? They're about looking at a handful of rows along with an input of a, a kilobyte or so, right, and making a decision against it and responding, right? Updating a piece of information, calculating a response, and sending that response back. These transactions, once they're put into the right partition to run, they complete in microseconds, right? They're very, very fast. There's really, it, and VoltDB running SQL is essentially the same as making a function call. Right? All of the data is in memory. Actually, it, it is literally a function call. What happens when you call SQL and Volt is uh, we have a plan, basically a prepared statement for that SQL statement. We plug in the parameters to it, and we call across the Java JNI library to a layer to a C++ library, and we say evaluate this plan for me. Right? It's just a C++ function call on a SQL statement. So anyway, so that. This, these things together is really fundamentally what makes Volt really fast and really transactional. Every stored procedure it has serializable isolation from all of the other work in the system. It has exclusive access to data and a timeline that's well ordered across the entire cluster. Right? So you end up with extremely strong isolation, transactionality, and the ability to transact really, really fast against in-memory data. 
you know, there were a few hands that went up. I'll just stop and ask some questions. I'm just curious. So are reads and writes simultaneous? I mean, I, effectively, um, you have, right, right now, no. Right now, there's a single reader, writer thread, reading partition. I think sometime in the near future, we're going to allow parallel reads for some different types of analytic workloads. But there'll always be a single writer in each partition. Doesn't that mean your transactions are always on one partition? Yes, so all of the transactions that scale, it's a, it's a disciple point. So all of the transactions that scale, sometimes we can do something a couple hundred thousand times a second. All of those transactions are, are relevant to a single partition, right? So say that I have a transaction against um, uh, some access point, right? Some Wi-Fi access point. I partition with the access point identifier, and so all of the data relevant to that access point is at one partition. At the same time, VoltDB allows um, both read and write transactions that cross partitions. These obviously have a very different scaling property. So we can do hundreds of thousands or millions of what we call single partition transactions, transactions that require data at only one partition to complete. And we can do hundreds to thousands of data set global transactions. What's really a common pattern in both is that the write intensive workload is single partition, right? So the event stream that you're bringing in is doing a lot of mutation of data, making a lot of real-time decisions. All of those decisions, the system is organized, the data model is such that they only need a single partition to run the completion. At the same time, users want an overall view of their data for, for BI or analytics or dashboarding. In that case, they use a combination of materialized views or our indexing structures, and they can do global reads really fast. So we scale global reads really easily. So it's global reads, especially, this is basically a, like what we call a one-shot read. Go find me the top end across my entire database. That's my entire query. Um, that doesn't need to block any of the writers, right? You just slot that read in at a serializable point in time. You do the read, you respond back. We have a pool of, of um, executors that are doing this read workload and, and aggregating results. Uh, and we do pretty common distributed SQL query planning to do read push down and push down and various other things like that. So you end up with what I think of as the machine speed workload. The microphone is moved. The machine speed workload happens at a single partition level. It's happening at hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of events per second. The human scale workload, the dashboarding aspect of it, or the kind of the reporting or the alarming aspect of it to an operator, is happening at a different time scale, right? That's something that's happening a few times a second, a hundred times a second, a thousand times a second. We see a lot of applications where somebody wants to mutate data really, really, really fast. They would provide a live dashboard to it. And for whatever reason, when you add up the number of dashboard queries, they're really commonly at 500 to 1,000 of them in a second. Right? And that's a read workload that we can easily scale globally across the system using a combination of materialized views to produce pre-aggregations along with intelligent ranking indexes in each partition. So pretty, pretty typical um, you kind of query optimization techniques. I've talked a lot about horizontal scaling. You add more nodes to Volt, it gets faster. It's a pretty common concept. Volt is replicated. I want to talk a little bit about replication. Um, and, and then I would like to talk about durability. And then I think I'll, I'll bring the, the talk to a conclusion there. We'll be at roughly an hour. And I'd like to ask, have a chance to answer any questions people have, either one or one or in a group. Um, so Volt DB is fault tolerant. We don't do log shipping or area style log shipping. I'm not sure how people how familiar people are with different um, um, replication strategies. In VoltDB, we do a logical replication. So when that stored procedure request arrives at the system, we identify which partition it needs to run at, a single partition, right, and all of the replicas of that partition. And we hand it off to a sequencer for that partition. So every partition has a sequencer associated to it. That sequencer's responsibility is to order all of the incoming work for this set of logical partitions and to communicate that order to all replicas. Right? So the data begins from a deterministic state at every replica. Everything in bold is strictly deterministic and strictly serial. So the data begins in a deterministic state. The, the manipulations you run against it are deterministic. We provide APIs if you want random numbers and time to maintain determinism across replicas. Uh, and so you end up with a deterministic result. At the same time, we do a lot of consistency checking and, and, and hashing of, of various input and outputs of the database to guarantee or to the operator that that everything has remained consistent and there's not a defect in the database or the application that violates that. So we do logical replication. That means that the replication that we're doing is happening in parallel across all the replicas of a partition and it minimizes the need for these partitions to communicate with one another before they commit a transaction. Right? Instead, they respond their results back to the sequencer, essentially. The sequencer says, 
got the same answers from everybody. Everybody gave all the same inputs to all the databases. That's a, a value that we hashed. I can respond back to a client. All of this is also um, kind of active, active, or master, master, however you want to think about it. When a client gets a response back from a whole database, the effect of that transaction has been committed at all replicas that have affected data, right? You always read all of your writes, regardless of where you sent the write and where you sent the read. It's a strictly consistent system in this regard. Is it all or a majority? Excuse me? Is it all, all replicas or a majority of the replicas? Is it a majority consensus? Is it all or a majority? All. Oh. All. Right, so so VoltDB, like I said, it's not a it's not a kind of system that's designed for high availability across a WAN, where you might run it across multiple Amazon availability zones or regions, or have one active database on the West Coast and one active database in London. Right, it's a strictly consistent system designed to run at high speeds on relatively fast local networks. Right, that within a single availability zone or in the back group connected by a network. Um, so, so you so you probably like. <laughs> if there wasn't one in the West Coast, you would probably just have like an update routine like that would, that would happen in some other... Yeah, what we typically see in that case is that people either run independent clusters and then push their data to a common OLAP system, um, or, uh, no, essentially anyone who wants to do high-speed decisioning, no one is willing to pay for the latency cost of actually maintaining an active active protocol. Right, so all of them are willing at that point to give up some level of consistency, and there's a number of different ways to do that. No one's going to pay for the latency cost of, of managing an active active database. The only person I know that does that is Google, and they actually do it because they own all the data centers and put GPS clocks on them and use a clock based ordering protocol, which was actually originally specified in the original HTML paper. So it's a very similar protocol. Um, but they're really unique in that they own the network, they own the hardware, they own the data center, uh, and they own all access to the data. So they could do something that's their F1 or standard project if you want to read about it. It's really, it's really kind of cool. Um, the other thing that's really cool about it is it's an argument for consistent databases over eventually consistent databases for transactional oriented applications based upon the experience of their analysts. Um, and so if you think about NoSQL versus consistent SQL oriented systems, it's a really interesting argument for consistent SQL systems. Um, VoltDB, as I've said many times, it's a memory, it's a, fur, a fully durable system. So when I say VoltDB is fully, fully acid, I mean really strictly that the D and durability implies a right to disk. Right? So VoltDB has two features that work in combination to maintain durability. The first is that it produces a point in time snapshot of all of its data. It can put the database in the copy on write mode and flush the copy to disk right? asynchronously with other work going on in the system. Secondly, it maintains a log of all of these incoming transactions. If you want to restore the system back to a durable state, you do two things. The system does this for you automatically as a combined action with two logical steps. First is that you replay the snapshot, right? So you bring the data back to that consistent point in time, and then you replay what we call the command log, this logical log of transactions that have been run since that snapshot was initiated. That brings the data back to a fully durable state. Um, this durability feature is tunable. You can turn it off completely. You can use snapshotting and no command logging. Uh, you can use uh, command logging in both a synchronous and an asynchronous mode. The strictest durability uh, configuration in VoltDB is that you run this command log what we call synchronous mode, meaning that the log is absent before a response to a client is received. And in this case, um, VoltDB guarantees that when a client sees a response, that the inputs to that, the, the, the effects of that transaction have been made durable in all replicas, all surviving replicas in the cluster. All right? So it's a very strong durability guarantee. Uh, we have customers that run basically in memory caches without durability, and we have customers that definitely rely on VoltDB as a durable store, so we see both. Um, it's kind of a second aspect of durability. So finally, I want to talk about just very briefly, because I have three more, two more minutes left in the time I wanted to allot myself, about our export connector. VoltDB has a kind of a, a little bit of a proprietary or different feature. We have tables that you can specify as export tables. They're essentially relational tables that are insert only. And the data that you insert into them is inserted in a transactional context, so if the transaction that the insert rolls back, the insert rolls back, but once that insert commits, that data gets bucketed together with other nearby inserts and handed off to an OLAP system through a connector framework. So we can hand data off to JDBC, to a CSV file, or uh, you know, to a queue like Kafka or Evident Queue or something like that. 
what happens a lot of times in a lot of old applications, you have some process, like a session begins, it gets updated really rapidly, and then the session ends. Right? It's kind of a logical pattern. And people want to archive a completed session. So they take all of that update workload, they put that essentially in memory with Volt because their OLAP system can't tolerate an update workload. Once that update is completed, they'll write that complete record to the export table and they'll let the OLAP connector uh, push that data downstream to, uh, to the OLAP system. 59 minutes and 10 seconds. So uh, I'd like to stop there. Um, I would like to just, I guess, very briefly bring this back to why I think this is important. I mean, the technology is, is fun. I think all technology, building things is a lot of fun. But what really excites me about Volt in particular uh, isn't that it does hundreds of thousands of transactions per second, or that it has a logical active-active replication strategy, or that it runs in the cloud. What really excites me about it is that I see it emerging at the intersection of these two major trends. Right? The fact that we are all online, the fact that we have all of this information that allows people to write algorithms that personalize our responses, and the fact that we're carrying around sensors and devices that allow that personalized interaction to be delivered to us. And the data management problem that results from that combination and needing a real-time tool to handle the ingestion, the decisioning, and the analysis of those inputs. So that's what really excites me. Yes? I got a good question. In financial engineering. Hang on, hold on to that okay. question for a second. Hold on. Take a second. Uh, before we continue, I just want to give a great big round of applause to Ryan Betts, field CTO of Goldman. Anyone who's come in, we, uh, after the beginning, you missed the message. We are giving away a $50 Amex gift card today. To, to win it, you have to either put your business card in here or fill out your name and info on one of these cards and fill that there. Um, if you got a business card, just kind of come up, pass them out. Otherwise, just, uh, otherwise you just fill out the form, and uh, we'll start taking questions. Yes. Hang on, just hold the question for a moment. Everyone's filling out the forms. One the monster is you the monster of money. What kind of computer is that? What kind of memory is that? How many of you are part that one of the monsters? I mean, the, if, if, how much memory will you require with that type of computer system? If we have one type of monster,
uh, I have tooling that generates arbitrary along the transactions, or I have a relational an object relational model right now, and I've built large application of an ORM that assumes arbitrary transaction control at the application level. Right? Those are not high velocity applications, and they're not the kinds of applications that that, um, that we're interested in in solving right now. Uh, guys, just raise your hands. I'll take one of you. <laughs> uh, I have so you a question. Uh, how to accommodate the uh, spatial data and what kind of uh, tools you, you have to query and view the... That's a really good... Yeah, so um, I have a conversation almost weekly with every team engineering around our trees. Uh, we don't currently implement uh, a spatial index, but I think very soon we will. We provide a number of different management monitoring tooling, so like in terms of operationally understanding the content of the database, but we don't provide any custom visualization tools on top of the database, right? People use Tableau or other tools to extract data from the database and build visualizations now. But, but you can hold it. We can hold that state of thought and mutate the transaction away really, really fast. Yeah. Okay. Oh, um, and if, 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 if I'm not, if I'm not getting this right, but. It sounded a lot like you talk about the trickling and um, the serial nature of transactions. What's the? It seems like there would be. Is there a vulnerability there on like on like power, or do you have like a? Or do you have like flash based memory for the OLAP? Yeah. Because right? it seems like as you were going back to OLAP, it seems like any sort of interruption is right. So um, so we in the case that you're not in the case that the OLAP system is disconnected or not available, the data that is for it is actually able to float to disk, so there's disk fact a storage of that OLAP data. Um, and in the same way that when we restore the system back to a durable state through a restoration of the snapshot and the command log, we can also use that command log to regenerate data that has been passed down to the OLAP system. So whenever we perform a snapshot, part of the state in the system is made transactionally correct. It is queued data for OLAP, right? It gets F synced as well. So, um, so there's a limited amount of time in which it shut down. Because I mean, how much no. how much disk space do you have? Like, that's up to you, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, next question. So, if transaction is storage procedures, storage procedures still can write in multiple tables. So right. In that case. Yes, that works fine. In the case of a storage procedure has access. And if it's a single partition procedure, it can write to all of the tables, all of the data in that partition. It, it can also go global right to all of the data. You could, for example, say I'll get all of my data everywhere in bulk, it'll be transactional, or it'll be very really fast. So the stored procedure has to have a transactional context to not just one table, but all of the tables in the system. But in this case, uh, this information is blocked from other items? Um, yes, the stored procedures are running in a back to back, right? So once one begins to run, then it has exclusive access to the data within that partition. And that partition contains slices of all the tables in the system. And so you could, for example, you, so a common case is that people will equal join on the partitioning key. So let's say that I have, um, let's go back to like the access point table. So I have an access point. I know a lot of metadata about it. And metadata is in one table. It's, it's partitioned on the access, access point ID. So where is it located? What are the things in proximity to it? Um, or whatever. So whatever, whatever random metadata you have on that one physical device. And then every time someone associates to it or a sensor associates to it, uh, you would petition that association also on that access point ID. Right, so now you can have a query like show me all of the accesses in the last five minutes from this particular device type on this particular device on this particular access point. All of the data to, to calculate that query would be in a single partition, but it would require multiple tables. Right? Or, you could, or you could just have a simple counter, log, log in the sensor ID and implement a counter to the access point so that how many associations have been made you know, over the last five minutes or whatever. So then you're going to write to two tables in one partition and that would be transactional. You could add a new record to the, to the sensor reported table and you could update a counter associated to the access point itself. You know, we just need to some examples to demonstrate. We've got time just for one more question, but you will be here for one-on-one -on -one questions afterwards. You didn't have a chance, right? So, it seems like the magic piece is that how the partition sets up. Yeah. Okay, so, so all these transactions are going to one partition at a time. As much as possible. Yeah. That's where you get your, your fast speed. Right. So what, what can you describe? Can you describe the magic at all? The magic? <laughs> um, hey, before he answers, are you, do you work for NASA or do you just wear the shirt? <laughs> 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 so, 
my bike was too. <laughs> my wife wrote an asset and I got this shirt. That's, so, um, the magic, so there's not really any, not exactly, so there's two parts, I think there's two possible answers to your question, I'm not quite sure which one, which question you were asking. So, in the case of how do you tell the system how to distribute data, um, you do that simply, we, there's a partitioning statement in the DDL, so you declare a table, and then you say partition this table and this attribute, right? And then as data, um, Arise in the system. Um, the stored procedures will also say this particular parameter of the stored procedure corresponds to this attribute of this table, which happens to be a partition attribute. And then they can find, right, they can value the value of the parameter and use that to find the associated data for a single partition transaction. So it's only encoded the partition. The partitioning is, yes, it's hand coded. Um, there's, there's research that, uh, um, I can now say Dr. Andy Pavel, he's been one of the grad students that was worked on Colt for a long time, or age store. He's actually written um, a lot of probability models you know, based on the Markov, typical Markov probability models around um, trying to auto-partition and writing database planning on auto-partitioning. It's really interesting research, but none of it's been commercialized yet. Um, he can actually have, for small databases, he, can, he, can, he has algorithms that will calculate uh, really good partitioning strategies with high likelihood of being correct. It's really kind of cool. The way it works is um, it comes up with a partitioning model that's pretty random, and then as procedures run, each procedure can attempt to run and it identifies if there's been a partitioning violation, basically, a lot like you detect a constraint violation, in which case it rolls back. You update the probability model that this happened, right? And then you can build a, a kind of a, by putting all those probability models together, you can start to build out refinements to your partitioning model. Now, but honestly, what we see is that very few problems are that hard to partition in this velocity space because almost always there's some kind of an event stream. And your only choice, if you want to scale that event stream, is to make that the partition thing. So the academic stuff is really cool, but it's it kind of in practice, it's, it's simpler or impossible. You don't find a lot of stuff that's kind of. Turing did it in World War II. <laughs> if only we could all be Turing. Be uh, Ryan will be here for one on one questions afterwards. Please give a great big round of applause to everyone. This $50 Amex gift card. Hang on one second, Sue Lynn. Mix it up. Oh. <laughs> okay, there you go. Close your eyes. You're looking in the mirror. Come on, close your eyes. Close your eyes and uh, pick out a card. I'm going to dig deep. All right. Read it out. Read it out loud. Um, Craig. Uh, what is that? That's me. Richard. Craig? He's like, that's me. Kurt? Oh, wait, what's Wait. your last name? I can't read it. C-U-R-T-I-N? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Curtin. 